as we can see with this sneak peek live behind the scenes here at breakfast television news is much more complicated uh, with sophisticated lighting with cameras and autocue and of course thankfully uh, well I didn't write this <laughs> presenters have a much more high profile role these days as part of the 50th anniversary breakfast will be running a series of special films now to get us started Richard Baker presenter of the first ever summary looks at the changing image of the newsreader <laughs> Television in the 1950s, a rather sedate affair. Singing, dancing, light entertainment, like What's My Line? If you were sort of years younger, I'd say you were one of those gorgeous little boys in buttons, but you can't be. But from this room in Alexandra Palace, a revolution was brewing. What you're about to see changed the way we look at the world. Here is an illustrated summary of the news. It'll be followed by the latest film... That's of me, introducing the first ever television news program exactly 50 years ago, today. In those early days, newsreaders were never seen because it was feared that our facial expressions might not always look impartial. And worse still, that we might turn the news into a personality performance. So instead of seeing my face, television news started out as a series of maps and charts. Union and Vietnamese representatives agreed on the subjects to be discussed. Not exactly riveting, is it? It is in a new. It was a whole year before professional presenters were allowed to be seen. We took it in turns to read the late night news summary to camera. We had no auto cue at first, and so you had to read everything off scripts, and that gave you a rather shifty look as you shuffled your papers. You could never really look the viewer in the eye. The Foreign Secretary's statement to the House followed a meeting he'd had with the Greek and Turkish foreign ministers who arrived in London yesterday from Zurich. And but technology was changing quickly. Autocue helped things, and soon newsreaders became trusted faces on the box. The bombing pause in the Vietnam War is over. In a broadcast last night, President Johnson said that all American peace moves had been rebuffed and that he had ordered the resumption of air attacks on supply lines in North Vietnam. We were recognizable, but not exactly celebrities. Angela Rippon did more than anyone to raise the profile of newsreaders with an appearance on the Morecambe and Wise show. There may be trouble ahead, but while there's moonlight and music and love and romance... Let's face the music! It looked as though we were about to step into show business. Was this good for the serious image of news? I don't think it affected news in general at all, because I really do think the public can say, yes, these are people who do a serious job, but at the same time, they're human beings like the rest of us. They have a sense of humour, and why shouldn't they let their guard down from time to time? The only time, I think, when there can be a conflict between the, if you like, the personality cult and the professionalism of being a newsreader is when, as a newsreader, you start to believe you are a star and you are bigger than the news that you're reading. But it brought a bit of a backlash. There was a feeling that the right people to do this job had to be journalists by profession, people with first-hand experience in the field. And today, the news anchor is expected to display a range of skills. I think the expectations now are uh, you've got to be more involved. You, you write your scripts. And you talk to the correspondents before you talk to them on air. And you feel as though you're more part of the programme, even though the end product might be much the same as it was then. So we've come a long way in 50 years. From faceless, short news bulletins to continuous news 24 hours a day. Good evening. Welcome to the BBC's News at 1 o'clock. Welcome to the 6 o'clock news. Good evening. Humberside police authorities facing... In the end, what it comes to is that people want the facts about what's happening. The presentation needs to be clear, well-written and well-spoken. As for the element of personality, well, that just has to be there when you appear night after night in people's homes. And what's wrong with that? 
You said it, Richard. Newsreaders dancing, that'll never no, catch that'll on. Never Not catch in the 21st on. century. Never going to happen. <laughs> and on breakfast tomorrow morning, we'll be... More on that through the morning. Dermot and Natasha. Mm, Helen, thank you very much. Now, it was 50 years ago this week that the BBC Television News was born. And for the second of our series commemorating the anniversary, we've looked back at political reporting over the decades with the BBC's former political editor, John Cole, and colleagues Andrew Marr and John Sargent. <laughs> Well, there you are. You can see what it's like. The camera's hot, probing eye. Uh, these monstrous machines and their attendants. A kind of 20th century torture chamber. That's what it is. We've been pushed around a little too much of late. White Ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. Just rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Well, it's been 12 years since I worked here. I've seen a lot of changes over the years and now I'm observing it as a viewer and listener. So I've come to a well-known Westminster watering hole to get the opinions of a couple of colleagues and friends who have been operating more recently in my old field. So how's things changed since my day? I wonder if the fundamentals have changed very much, John. I mean, the basis of kind of grappling with a morass of competing <laughs> facts and trying to explain to people, roughly speaking, what's going on. Winston Churchill found it a very uneasy medium. He underwent a screen test once. I'm sorry, I must admit uh, they have to uh, descend to this level, but uh, we all have to keep faith with modern improvement. Had a look at it, didn't like what he saw, and never did any television afterwards. I first came here in 1977 to report, and I think it was a amazing difference in terms of both technology what you actually dealt with but also what was going on in the house of commons there was no radio no television you wrote out what they said in shorthand you then went to the studio where you spoke for just over a minute and if you were very lucky you could put stills in of the people that you were referring to <laughs> still <laughs> photographs of the prime minister the leader of the opposition I and mean, i think the technology always gets in the way, whether it's steam-driven, mm. whether it's new, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, my, m one of my earliest experiences was the light going off, standing outside central office, doing a live. The light goes off, the cameraman leans up to try and fiddle with it, burns his fingers, shouts <laughs> and then falls across, <laughs> the, across the camera. The funniest for me was saying that Margaret Thatcher wouldn't come out of the British Embassy when she received the bad news that Michael Heseltine had forced her into a second round of the leadership ballot. I said she wouldn't come out and my earpiece wasn't working and it was there was audience research done which showed that 13 million people were watching at that moment and so 13 million people shouted she's behind you. I keep reading in the newspapers about spin. I wonder if it is any different from people in Mrs Thatcher's government who weren't very happy. It seems to me that after the government got into a terrible, appalling mess, um, partly through uh, Alistair Campbell's over-enthusiastic efforts, um, they have drawn back a bit. Mm. Peter Mandelson once decided that he wouldn't take uh, any hospitality from the BBC for one year because of me. <laughs> when I started, I was still in newspapers, I wrote something about him uh, when he just started, and he wrote me a note saying, uh, after what you've written, I will never uh, speak to you again. Please do not try to contact me by letter, phone, or in person ever again. <laughs> and then he signed it, yours sincerely, Labour Party Director of Communications, <laughs> which I thought was wonderful. I am still in the, in the hot seat. What do you think the biggest challenge to people still doing the job at the moment is? The principal job is to engage the public in politics by every means that you can do and since politics since television is the most powerful medium uh, where people get their political reporting it's down to you really i've got a very simple wish could bbc correspondents be taught not to wave their hands anymore is that is that is that no, possible i think it's a natural human thing to do <laughs> um i have a little clipping in my study uh which says um some academic piece of ac spurious academic research saying three communicators Hitler, Clinton, and Ma. 
all obsessive hand wavers. Yes, quite exactly. Actually Which for years has been the most potent symbol of the division of Europe. And there can be few better illustrations of the changes which are sweeping across this continent. The pleasure in watching the Berlin Wall come down is that it was a good thing. Just about everybody had reason to be happy. And that night, television did more than just watch history being made. It, it contributed to it. Because almost everybody in East Germany could watch West German television. They could see that their government was weak. And if they came out in the streets, they could push it over. So the Berlin Wall could keep people apart, but it really couldn't cope with the electronic age. When television began, foreign news meant strange places and strange stories. These were not countries we knew about. Woodrow Wyatt told us about civil unrest in faraway Cyprus. And when he got to about here, he pulled out a gun and he shot a policeman dead on the steps just here. Like some weird and crazy football match, we stand and watch the bombs fall around this isolated outpost. Bastogne is held by the South Vietnamese, but only just. In the old days, there were very few satellite points on the planet from which to send your story back to London. You could be covering the war in Cambodia and find the logistics as nightmarish as the battlefield itself. You could be on this armoured train. You had to somehow get to Phnom Penh, wasted an airfield under rocket fire, put your film on a flight to Saigon. Today, technology means same-day coverage is a given. From Tiananmen Square, the sound of gunfire sounded like a battle, but it was one-sided. After hours of shooting and facing a line of troops, the crowd is still here. They're shouting, stop the killing and down with the government. The Chinese authorities had closed down the satellite link, so we didn't uh, get any reports out directly. We smuggled them down people's jeans. And on the night of the massacre, it was quite dreadful. Chinese people came up to us and said, those who spoke English, they will kill you, they will kill you. And they were more frightened for us at times than we were. And we saw one other camera out that night, TV camera. That was it. And that's why we stayed. Television made us familiar with the world. Technology shrunk it putting our correspondents closer to the action and speeding their stories home. In Bosnia was unusual because we were caught up almost on the front line of a war and on and off for three and a half years to a very limited extent. We, we shared the dangers of the ordinary people. Got hit by a piece of, uh, piece of shrapnel. Oh, I was just out of cover for too long. There was a lot of shooting and mortar fire and I, we just couldn't pin down what was going on. But it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't that serious. I'll survive. But what struck me really was the feeling that how privileged I was that I got a flight out of the best medical treatment. If I'd been an ordinary Sarajevan, I'd have been taken uh, to hospital. I, I couldn't have been well treated because the medical facilities were under such pressure. But journalism is becoming a riskier trade. Too often these days, the shortcut to a headline is not to talk to a journalist, but to kill one. Simon Cumbers was killed just a few weeks ago. In the same attack, Frank Gardner, our security correspondent, was seriously injured. To me, it's always been the ultimate challenge, and you can even sometimes do some good. Wars are the pivotal moments in someone's history. And if you ask me, would you do it all over again? Absolutely. Berlin has moved on. The wall is now one of the city's tourist attractions, and at Checkpoint Charlie here, once a fearsomely dangerous place, souvenir stalls have replaced the watchtowers. But it's a really strange sensation that something I saw as news is now going into the history books. But that's what news is all about. That's why we all still go on doing it. And that's why it's still a privilege to be allowed to say, Brian Hanrahan, BBC News.